five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. I'm guessing many, if not most of you, are aware of the Dear Moon project. Japanese entrepreneur Yusako Mezawa, or MZ, is inviting eight artists to join him on a circumlunar flight on Starship. One of the eight selected crew is American documentary filmmaker Brandon Hall. He's our guest on this episode, and we discuss everything from his motivation to apply over the selection process to his objectives for the mission, and we even talk about some of the things he may want to take along on the trip. Dear Moon has everything to be one of the most fascinating human spaceflight missions ever, and this episode is our first inside look at it. Don't miss it. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hey, space enthusiasts, welcome back to another episode of the Space Business Podcast. And as you longtime listeners know, even though we have the word business in here, that doesn't mean we only interview CEOs. You know, every once in a while, we also have really interesting people from the space ecosystem in general on. And today I'm really thrilled. This is the first interview in which I hope is going to be a serious interview with the crew of the Dear Moon project. And I hope you guys all know, but in case you don't, Dear Moon is a project financed by a Japanese billionaire, Yusako Meizawa. He's an internet e-commerce billionaire. And he's basically taking a crew of people on a circumlunar flight. And that crew has just recently, beginning of December, been announced. And we have our first guest from the group today, Brandon Hall. Welcome, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you. So, Brandon, there's so many things we could talk about. But let me just ask you, where were you when you were told that you're part of the crew and what went through your mind? Oh, man, I was at my desk in New York. You'll hear this from other crew members, too. But MZ had done a series of interviews at this point. It was the end of 2021, uh, mm -hmm. just before the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. And he said, I'd like to do one final Zoom interview. The MZ will ask you some questions. We'll figure mm -hmm. out kind of who the crew is after that. Mm -hmm. And so I was preparing all these random answers to questions I didn't know he'd even ask. I was talking about myself. I was trying to figure out what I would say if they asked me different things. I got my lighting all prepared in my room. And I was like, okay, this is my final interview. And so I was sitting at my desk in the little Zoom icon was loading and then the screen came up and usually it would be MZ and then a few other people he's working with. And this time mm -hmm. it was just him. And I was looking at him and we made some small talk and he said, well, Brendan, I actually have the results of Dear Moon. Would you like to know what our selections are? And <laughs> time kind of stopped for a second for me because yeah. I knew that there would be a sentence that he's about to say that would change the entire course of my life. Yeah. And something that was important to me through the process is I made sort of a promise to myself that no matter what happened in Dear Moon, I would try to take these values that I wanted to have if I were selected and still carry them through my life, you know, mm -hmm. uh, kindness and empathy and storytelling for impact. And I said, no matter what happens with what he's about to say, I, I promise that I, I will carry that forward. And he said, I'd like to have you as a crew member of Dear Moon. You've been selected. Will you join me on this mission? And I just fell out of my chair. I couldn't even believe it. And in terms of how I felt, it was 
it was hard to process, but it was a sense of relief of obviously just deep excitement and like incredulous <laughs> disbelief at what I had just experienced. And then I was mm -hmm. sitting there talking to him, but also it was just the greatest honor. I had this really like world shaking feeling that everything in my life was about to get kind of different. So I was just proud. I was really yeah. proud. And I assume you said yes right away. I did. I said it would be the honor of my life to to join this yeah. mission. I mean, with you. That kind of strikes me like sort of similar to if somebody asks you to marry them, right? It's not you're not going to go like, oh, let me think about this for a day. You kind of either like, no, I don't want to do it after all. I'm too scared, or like, no, yes, I'm going to do it. Definitely, and I think as the selection process got more intense, uh, the, the candidates started whittling down, and it got to what was about a top 20. That was the time I really started weighing what this means, uh, weighing the life or death risk, the mm -hmm. personal, professional risk, and what this would look like. And I knew that if I did get selected, I wanted to be ready. You know, you can't be asked to be a part of a mission and say, okay, now I'm going to weigh what this all really means. Mm. Um, there was a part of my mind, I think, that during the selection process, I really just focused on being me, being myself, talking about my work. And I tried to let go of thinking of too many of the stakes of what was before me, that mm. uh, I was speaking to this, this influential entrepreneur, that I was in front of this amazing group of artists and creatives, I just tried to think of Brendan and who could I be. But I think that as much as I tried to push away the stakes, because if they got two in my head, it, it'd be difficult, <laughs> you know, to do this stuff. I really made sure I weighed what this all means and the mm. weight of it, what I'd accomplish or try to accomplish if I was part of the mission, because I took that selection really seriously, both, both from my risk and also mm -hmm. the fact that there are so many people that do amazing work in this position. So I wanted to be ready and confident and say, I'm in. If you want mm -hmm. me to be a member of the team, I'm, I'm ready for it and I will give you everything I possibly can. So, mm -hmm. And what, what did that, if you don't mind, what did that sort of analysis or research look like? So as you realized that you were kind of going down the funnel and this might actually happen... You're saying, for example, you're analyzing the risk and other things. Like, what kind of stuff were you researching? And then also, you know, how were you, when did you get, for example, your family, I mean, if you want to talk about it, when did you get your family involved? Because, I mean, I don't know, you have like a wife or something, or, but you definitely have parents, right? And this is obviously, yeah. there's some risk to this. Like, when did you say, hey, look, I may go to the moon. How do you guys feel about it? And, and all of that. It's a great question. So I have a family. Um, uh, my parents, but I also have a partner of four years, mm. Gabby, who's also a filmmaker. So from the outset, I think she immediately appreciated uh, what was happening, appreciated this mission and this whole process. She's been nothing but positive and supportive and the same with my parents. But I think it was around the time when I got a medical examination. So this was maybe like four or five months into the selection process. Uh, I was flown to UCLA and got a series of, of medical exams from their doctors and staff that included an EKG and different panels of blood work and chest and spine x-rays. And that was the first time it really settled in that they were making a real investment in me, that I was part of a smaller group that might can be considered to be selected. And I both because MZ had begun putting real resources into me and also just because obviously it was feeling a bit more real at that point. That was a time when I started talking more seriously with my friends, with Gabby, with my parents and saying, look, this is obviously this crazy, amazing, exciting thing. But let's let's strip that back for a second. Um, I really trust SpaceX. I trust their track record. Um, of all mm -hmm. of all companies doing this right now, I feel very comfortable that they're going to design um, a system that will support us and a system that will keep us safe. And there's a, there's a lot at stake if if they don't or if any of these companies don't. And I feel um, based on my research, I felt confident in that. But as any mission goes, especially one going around the moon and kind of into some of this more uncharted territory on a civilian level, um, there's obviously big risks involved. And so I'd say it's around the time of the medical exam when I realized that, okay, I, I went from being someone in a million people that applied and it's getting mm -hmm. very real. There might be 20 or 30 of us left. So let's sit and really have conversations and make sure we're on board with this. And mm. uh, Gabby and my parents, they were nothing but supportive. But mm. but through this whole process, it's been important to me to have those more 
serious conversations. And it's a big life change too. It, it takes a lot of devotion. It's going to take a lot of hard work, no matter what the, the training process looks like and how this just informs the day-to-day of my life. I mean, just mm-hmm. the past week, uh, I went from being, I'm, a, I'm still a filmmaker, but you know, a filmmaker doing my own work and being on my own schedule. And um, things were a lot different before this public announcement. And mm-hmm. now I'm already beginning to feel the weight of what that's like in my daily life. But I'm also just more honored and motivated every day to to keep doing this so yeah because i mean as one one is uh, you're absolutely right one thing is sort of the let's call it the physical risks right but as you very rightly pointed out i mean you know when this all goes ahead i mean to some extent even now but increasingly so you're going to become i think it's fair to say one of the most famous people in the world i mean <laughs> i mean it's it's probably a fair guess that when this mission happens it's going to be one of the most watched events ever right and sort of how do you feel about that and sort of the I don't know, I guess the responsibility that also to some extent brings. I mean, we'll see what happens. But first and foremost, it's an incredible honor. Like I can't speak enough to the legacy of space travel that that precedes us, mm. uh, both both internationally through NASA, through public and private institutions. It's an absolutely incredible honor. And I, I recognize every day that any success we have and any ability to do this comes off of that foundation that so many amazing people have built and taken risks for. Mm -hmm. And so first I just absorbed that and I'm always full of gratitude for that. Um, And then second, it just inspires me to get to work and work as hard as I possibly can bring in the most talented people I possibly can to both teach me and help work with me and work with our crew as a team to say, we might have a chance to create this historic platform for discussion for the way a mission like this goes and how do we use that the best we can? Um, How do we share messages, create impact and real measurable impact? You know, Uh, a good message only goes so far, but how do we actually see that uh, translate into impact on the earth um, legislation, the ways we preserve both earth and space. And so I'm feeling all of that. And then as a filmmaker, it's just about how does this story get told in the most impactful way possible? Mm-hmm. We're still all developing what projects we'll create as artists, the mm-hmm. ways we individually create projects and come together as a team. But what I know is that my my lens as a filmmaker is through telling human-driven stories in nature. Um, leading up to Dear Moon and through the application process, I I talked a lot about a film I'm finishing this year. It's called Parks for the People, and it's a feature length mm-hmm. film about national parks. Mm-hmm. And the whole premise of it is following me and a friend road tripping through U.S. national parks and meeting people that embody those landscapes. So a trail builder, a Native American speaker, mm-hmm. a French Vietnamese photographer, and a female solo backpacker. Mm-hmm. And what I learned through doing that project is that sometimes these human stories can connect us to nature, connect us to a place more than just seeing a beautiful landscape. And so by by seeing someone's wonder and, and transformation through an experience in the natural world, it makes us want to do the same. It makes us want to connect. And then when we preserve mm-hmm. the earth, we start thinking about preserving these experiences that that we're having on it and these experiences of connection and finding ourselves. And um, it also just builds empathy ideally as a tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see yes. other people and it connects you to them. And so what I'm getting at is that when we have this opportunity for this mission, and I hope the world is watching, and I hope that we were we can tell this story in a way that inspires that same kind of empathy and preservation. Um, and so that's kind of the lens I really want to try to bring, uh, is to, to think about that moment and say, what is the most powerful way we can make this an event for people and really feel it? So so, so this is really interesting, right? Because you could then take the, 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 the actual lens, right? The camera lens, and you could sort of like direct it various directions, right? You could sort of like look at the moon and that's in its own way, very, very beautiful, right? Even though there's for we know no life down there. I guess you could direct it inside this, the starship at your crewmates and sort of record their reactions and what the interaction is between your crewmates and the experience, which may be something you were alluding to, I guess you could direct the camera lens back at Earth, right? And of course, we all remember these really famous pictures from the Apollo missions when they look back at Earth and it's sort of like, I think it stirred something very emotional and in many of us. Or you could even start before the mission on Earth and sort of talk to people how they think 
about the moon? I mean, I know, I know it's very early on, but kind of have you thought about sort of where you want to train your, your camera lens? Absolutely. And, and so what I'm speaking from now is, is from passion and excitement. Mm. Um, this doesn't reflect any kind of formal structure we've created in, in sure. what I'm capturing or the other crew members. But yeah, you know, I think in some ways, all of those things are deeply applicable and part of the story. Uh, the ways we connect to people here on Earth, our crew inside the capsule, as well as what's outside the window. But I do think that what's really special about this mission and why I really hope we tell the story in the right way is because we've seen Earth rise and we've seen these images of the moon and the Earth from space. But this uh, group of civilians and artists who have a really kind of unfiltered and unique personal perspective of how we're going to react to all this um, is going to be really special. I think a lot of artists and creative people, and so many of us are creative, I think everyone has their own creativity. Mm. But artists, I think, have a certain sensitivity to the world around us, which is special, where a lot of our job is to feel really deeply, sometimes overwhelmingly so, and figure out how to translate that experience or that connection with someone into a medium. And so I'm really excited to see how we change through the process and what that moment really feels like of us being up there in the capsule and the dynamics. Because what's unique about Dear Moon isn't just a, a flight around the moon. It's this group of people that all comes mm -hmm. from these different walks of life, different countries, different perspectives. And I just think we're going to see reactions to this whole scene and what's going on that feel a little different than what's happened before. And so that's what excites me personally and what mm -hmm. I think is going to be special. Um, so I'm just excited for people to tune in and to help share that story. And like I said, it's the, the greatest honor to be able to get excited about this and really plan in that way. So mm -hmm. you're also going to be obviously by definition in a very different environment than your usual environment or all of our environment here on earth. You're going to be, I mean, when you're up there in microgravity, have you thought about how that may change anything in your work and your approach? Absolutely. I mean, the, the short answer is that I'm going to be talking to camera manufacturers um, mm -hmm. I'm already beginning to reach out and be connected with people who have developed technology to film, and take photographs in space. Mm -hmm. And I just see it as an exciting new challenge. And as filmmakers, photographers, our goal is always to use tools to tell the story in the way we envision it. And so I'm still learning those tools first of how mm -hmm. to do that. And it'll just be a process of gathering knowledge and, and seeing how we apply it. But um, it'll come story first. What I'm excited about too is so much of this is going to be unexpected of how we feel, what happens. Like, I think that some of the most magic moments that happen up there are ones we can't plan at all. Mm. But my goal will be to kind of learn every tool possible. So I'm ready to adapt and capture it as it happens. Does that mean you maybe even you guys should be filming all the time because you don't know what's going to happen. And afterwards you kind of do the magic through editing or. Yeah. We're going to have as, as any of my projects, many, many, many more hours of footage than um, our story can hold, but that's mm -hmm. the the beauty of it, you know, and um, it'll be fun too, to see the ways we, we use that footage in the future and just have it as a historical document as well. And every year camera technology is getting smaller and more mm -hmm. powerful. Memory cards are holding more data. Uh, the technology mm -hmm. is getting just so much more developed that I, I am so excited to see how we can use modern technology as well to implement into this. So mm -hmm. let's take a step back, um, back to the beginning. So when the, the dear moon call first came out, when, when MZ first talked about it and, you know, he published like, look, I'm, you know, I want to search for a crew here. That's going to come with me to the moon. What made you apply? <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, first when I saw it, I just saw it on a news article. Um, mm -hmm totally by chance. You know, I, I woke up that morning and I could have done anything differently that day. And I might never have seen this article. And when I did, it just filled me with this wonder and excitement. I had never seen anything like it. Um, this idea of bringing artists and creatives into space and what made me want to apply, I mean, first was my body of work is like I spoke about earlier, uh, kind of about that human connection to nature and mm -hmm. the ways we interact with the natural world. And I had come off this parks project and been telling stories in nature and finding out how to take that immense uh, wonder and feeling I felt 
when I was hiking, when I was under the Milky Way, you know, shooting mm-hmm. time lapses and bringing that back to people. And I, I've been traveling all around the world, making films and having these experiences and seeing these different walks of life that when I saw this, I said, I just can't even imagine how amazing it would be to get to capture stories in space. That was the first thing that came to my mind was this is a human story. And so I applied just hoping that that perspective was meaningful, um, that I it'd be an extension of my work that I'd be really proud of um, and something that would just kind of push me in every way. I, I love being challenged and kind of diving into the deep end and being uh, living in that discomfort because I find that once something is, is just deeply uncomfortable and challenging, um, but you know you can do it and you get past that thing, then even the next thing that feels deeply uncomfortable or, or challenging is even way crazier than you would have envisioned like a couple steps ago, you know? And so applying for this, which I never thought in a million years I'd get selected for it, mm-hmm. um, just because of the vast amount of people that are applying around the world. Uh, I just couldn't imagine a, a more exciting and wonderful challenge to try to take on. And the selection process brought even more challenges personally that I worked through and tried to bring my best self to. So, mm-hmm. And so how did that initial motivation, how did that, because I think the initial requirement, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like a video as well, right? How did that translate into the video? Like what, I think it was a relatively short video from memory, right? Like what, what did you actually talk about in your video? And was it something like you immediately knew what we we're going to talk about? Was it something like you had to like redo the video like a dozen times and until you got it where you wanted it to be? So, so my story is kind of, kind of a fun one where I was asked to submit a video. Uh, I had devoted the whole day before the deadline to work on it. Mm. And it was late at night, the night before um, I was going to work on it the next day. And I checked back at the deadline just really quickly. And I realized that Japan time, which was the deadline time, was was 13 hours ahead of where I was. And that by the time I kind of woke up and got going the next day, the video would already be due. <laughs> and I had a, a really clear moment where I, I said, Brendan, you should go to bed. You're always staying up late, working on film projects. You're always like losing sleep and doing this. And now you're going to stay up again to try to apply to go to the moon. Like, I think this is the moment where you've gotten a little crazy <laughs> and you've mm-hmm. lost it. And I said, you know what? Let's just work for an hour and a half, set a time cap work for mm-hmm. an hour and a half, create a video, do something quick and just submit it. So at least you feel like you tried. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I did. I, I really quickly set up a video camera, microphone uh, for the one minute video. I recorded a single like four minute take and just very quickly tried to sum up um, my career and where I've come from in that one minute. And I basically mm-hmm. said, I'm Brendan, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I'm a director, cinematographer, and editor. I had a formative experience in the national parks in the U.S. in the middle of college that made me fall in love with nature and inspired to make films. And I think this Dear Moon mission is a human story and a human story I'd love to capture on film. And so if you, if I have the honor of being selected, I'd love to work on that. And uh, I put in footage my national parks of the people I had filmed with, and it all came together very quickly. So... Uh, I actually didn't have the liberty of doing a lot of takes, but mm. I think in a way that maybe helped remove some of the filter or second guessing. Yeah. And with this whole experience, I mean, with these interviews and with how quickly things have progressed. And I mean, last week for me, a huge landmark being on the Today Show, which uh-huh. as a guy who a few weeks ago wasn't in the public eye at all, was another one of these kind of huge leaps for me to just dive into, but uh, I had no time to second guess myself. And I think that that's maybe what made the most authentic kind of telling of that story. Yeah, exactly. That's probably a good thing. It's just like allowed your passion to come through without any sort of artificial intellectual filter afterwards or something like that. And so I don't know, are you guys allowed to talk about the process or not? I don't know. I mean, to the to extent you guys are allowed, sort of like, what did the rest of the process look like? Like, how many rounds were there? Was it like more videos? Was it in-person interviews? Like, what actually happened? Essentially, what happened was it, it began as the just initial um, entry that turned into the video submission. And then a lot of the interviews were conducted over Zoom at the beginning. It was during the pandemic. 
Uh, we were all in different corners of the world, including MZ. And so the first interview was on Zoom. Uh, it was with a couple representatives from Dear Moon um, and then uh, a Japanese astronaut named Naoko, who she actually mm -hmm. um, has been on. I think she rode the space shuttle Discovery and went to the ISS. And um, they just did a really thorough interview. And it was all about character, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, background, mm -hmm. um, what I believe in, my kind of personal missions and work. And and through the process, what I really value is the, the line of questioning was really trying to get to the root of who we are and what we mm -hmm. believe and kind of the spirit we bring forward. Uh, we did a group interview over Zoom, where it was me and another few fellow candidates, a couple of which actually made it onto the crew. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, we eventually did a Zoom medical exam, a Zoom psychological exam. Mm -hmm. um, and the main in-person moments were first my medical examination at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of pinnacle of it all was a group meetup in Houston, Texas. Uh, MZ was there because he did a really inspiring um, flight up to the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. And he was training sure. there at NASA at the time. So he could kind of interact with the U.S. quarters of the ISS. And we had about 11 candidates for Dear Moon meet up in Houston and do a series of interviews uh, together there. And we did activities, kind of team building sort of things and had a chance to really interact with each other, see who else was there for this opportunity and go through different challenges, uh, which ranged everything from just in-person meetups to group interviews. Um, and it wasn't part of the selection criteria, but at one point we actually played ping pong together, which some of my other crew members have spoken about was a really unique moment of just seeing the ways we all interacted and came together. Um, past then, we had another Zoom interview uh, digitally a couple months later, and that led into the selection. So it, it was a year of a mixture of Zoom interviews and then that main kind of in-person meetup. Uh, and like I said, it was all about character and the ways we interacted and obviously speaking to our work and what we create Mm -hmm. but also um, just what kind of impact we'd like to leave through this mission. And something that I've really enjoyed seeing is, first of all, I love spending time with MZ, a really mm -hmm. positive time. His whole team around them is fantastic. Uh, but the other crew members, we get along really well. We travel together well. We have really great conversations. And so something I'm excited about is everyone brings a different energy and a different background. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I'm just really grateful to be a part of a group that, excites me to spend time with in that way so do so you think this is going to be also a very synergistic crew in terms of what they are ultimately the artistic output is going to be for for humanity definitely yeah and also just so i get the mention in there the astronaut that interviewed us was naoko yamazaki mm -hmm. i want to make sure i give her full credit with her name because she's amazing and on that first zoom call to log in and see her there because <laughs> i recognized her i was like okay this is real This isn't just an online competition that feels beyond belief. I'm now being interviewed by an astronaut, uh, which was pretty crazy. So <laughs> did you have a chance to ask her questions as well? I wish I did. You know, I had a lot of questions I would have loved to ask her. And <laughs> exactly. I, I that, hope that was to the still get question. the chance. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you want to ask? <laughs> I think I, I would have really just liked to ask more about her perspective having gone through this and advice that she'd have moving forward. And um, at that stage, you know, it was so early. I don't think I had fully materialized that I might actually get selected for this. So mm. my my goal was just to put my best foot forward to show them every layer of who I am and what I create so that they feel like they're making a really good pick if they do choose me. Because um, it's important. I, I really, much more than wanting me to be selected, which I'm really proud of, I wanted to show them everything about who I am and what I'm about so that they can make a great selection. You know? And similar to how uh, NASA and these space agencies have classes mm -hmm. of astronauts and they have to make the hard decisions to choose certain people. Mm -hmm. um, for our unique uh, group as a civilian spaceflight, I still wanted them to choose people who would best represent all this, best bring energy. And at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you're with a small group locked into a tiny capsule. Um, and that needs to go well. It needs to be yeah. positive. And the whole needs to become greater than the sum of its parts where our mission and our work and our collaboration can transcend just our individual output, I feel like. And um, to come back to what I would have loved to ask Naomi, 
Sunoco, um, I did have a really great chance to speak with another former astronaut, Dan Tan, who's done a spacewalk mm-hmm. and flown to the ISS as well. And he just gave me great advice where I, I asked, how can we honor this legacy of what comes before us and the folks like you that have worked their entire lives to create inspiration through space flight? And, and he just gave me some really empowering words that um, the the wonder that we're spreading, the impact that we're spreading in, in these messages, I think that is probably why you have a podcast and why listeners mm-hmm. tune in and why both mm-hmm. entrepreneurs and engineers and artists feel like we want to be part of this this great endeavor. Um, he said, we're all part of the same team doing this. So, so respect the legacy, honor the really hard work and people that came before you to get you into that seat. Um, but also just like make an impact and spread that wonder and do the best you can with your work. So those, I'm excited to keep talking to people that have been in somewhat similar shoes to us in terms of taking on the risk of going into space and learn something from it. Because I think that those lessons are really important to pass on to both what went really well and what someone might have learned and say, you know, if I could do it again, I would do it in this way. Because that that's something I think that we can all bring forth as well is uh, lessons learned, mistakes made. Yeah. This is just the first mission of so many more where my grandkids uh, might see this and go, yeah, you know, that's cool that you were, you know, one of the first, but now they're doing this every day. Uh, we got a high, the, high school trip. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So the goal is just, I think, to teach people as well and say, whatever we learn through doing this, the next mission can be even better and expand this mission even more. So I guess it goes part to answering the next question I was asked you sort of like, for you, what would be the sort of ideal outcome or outcomes of the mission? Yeah, and that's something I'm still, still working on because there's a lot of different ways to consider that. I think what I'm thinking of now is my ideal outcome is first to create a, a piece of work or collaborate on a piece of work that I'm really proud of. Uh, help capture the story and tell it in a way that I think is worthy of the historic nature and global platform that this mission may have. And filmmaking uh, in any creative outlet is really tough to tell the story right, get it distributed in the right way, and make an impact on people. But I think we have a real opportunity here to tell a powerful story um, and hopefully inspire people. And so my first goal is create a product or work on a product that, that lives up to the potential of what we could do here. And then I think the other, and something I've learned through being in national parks is uh, preservation, preservation of our planet and also preservation of space. This is a new era of travel and we're going to be kind of quickly chasing behind, I think, to figure out how we do preserve Mm -hmm. these spaces, how we do preserve space as a global community, how we protect these resources for us to enjoy, for us to marvel at, to have unpolluted night skies back here on earth and to be traveling traveling in space in a way that's responsible and sustainable and only makes life on earth better. And so they're broad themes, but I especially think early lights or missions like ours have a really deep responsibility to consider that and be some of the earliest adopters of saying we're developing so quickly. Technology is developing at this exponential rate. How do we catch up to it with Mm. with ethics and standards and ways Mm. to come together that similar to how we've preserved, say, Antarctica uh, on the bottom of our Earth, how do we preserve this resource as well? Um, And like the park system in the U.S. and around the world, it's a balance of uh, preservation of land, of resources, of wildlife, and enjoyment. You know, it's equal part, how do we gain wonder and inspiration and uh, a unique experience from being in these places? And Mm so those are my goals. And um, aside from just a positive message, I think what I'll be working on and our crew is taking these goals we have and aligning them, and then saying, how do we turn that into a real tangible impact, measurable impact? I forgot to ask you before, at some point in time, you mentioned you had a, a formative experience in the national parks. What, what was that actually? Yeah. Um, so I was in college. I went to NYU. To film mm-hmm. school here in New York City. Um, and when I went into film school, I've been making films since I was 12. Um, I got mm-hmm. a little camcorder in my backyard and that turned into me making everything, uh, documentaries and short films and uh, spooky narrative films and working mm-hmm. with my friends as actors to eventually even filming in the skateboard industry. Um, and filming skateboarding and BMX bike riding. And I was already kind of learning or seeing how film can let me walk in other people's shoes and and engage in these situations I would have never been able to go to otherwise. But when I went into NYU, I wanted to make narrative films. And I always had dreams of being in Hollywood, you know, trying to work for a studio or something like that. And then in the middle of college, 
I took a road trip out to LA to uh, Los Angeles to do a couple internships in the film industry with, I thought it was my dream at the time, you know, working for these companies, being in an office, reading scripts. But I quickly found myself falling in love with hiking in the evenings in nature on the West Coast. So I'd work four days a week and then I'd drive all night Thursday to Yosemite or National Park and start mm -hmm. hiking a few days over the weekend and drive back really late. And I just had this deepening sense that um, that was what I enjoyed. Like that wasn't just a career. That was something that made me really happy. Um, and I hadn't, I grew up on a small lake, but I had never quite appreciated the impact of nature in my life and how connected I felt, um, how present and just the beauty of these experiences, the sunsets and the night skies. I just felt the sense of connection with everything mm. that I had never felt before. And it was driving back from that summer. I was on a road trip with my friend, Anthony, and we first went to the Grand Canyon and all these other national parks in the Southwest. Uh, and it really crystallized for me seeing this just astounding wonder of nature, that this was what made me happy. And that the points in my life, I had thought I wanted to make narrative films at that time, but I grew up watching Planet Earth and reading that Geo and mm. being just in love with this kind of natural storytelling. People People exploring these new places and trying to share what that felt like. Uh, it, it was just a crystallizing moment where I came back from that summer and said, I want to make documentaries. I really want to try traveling the world, uh, telling meaningful stories, and beginning to understand through that a little bit more about how people work and what it's like to live on this planet. Uh, I've been wanting to write fictional stories for so long, but mm -hmm. I knew very little about what it actually means to, to live and be an adult and go through, you know, struggles and hardship and um, so much that I had this dream of beginning to travel to make documentary films and tell, you know, at the time, like more uh, everyday real stories that I was experiencing. Um, and that's, that's what happened. I came out of college. I worked for a little while at the National Geographic Channel. Um, mm -hmm. I had got an internship there assisting in development and production, mm -hmm. and that turned into a job. But I eventually moved on from there to uh, begin traveling and telling telling stories, making commercial work, you know, working for brands and nonprofits. And I worked on a national parks film, uh, Parks for the People, which I'm now finishing, which has been my like big five-year odyssey to make my own feature-length documentary. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just felt really grateful that those preserved places gave me an experience that set me on the path to just what I love doing and what feels yeah. like the, the best way I can contribute uh, right now. And it led to Dear Moon. So I'm just, like I've said, I'm just very grateful and doing the best work I can. So in your, in your sort of travels to the national parks and other places, I guess, you know, those are also really great places to observe the night sky, right? And to look at the moon. Any special sort of feelings you had when you or you have when you look at the night sky any special feelings and thoughts about the moon as an object i oh i feel all the feelings and night sky photography and night sky time lapses uh have been some of the most connected i've ever felt to, to everything i mean the first times really seeing unpolluted night skies and the milky way and shooting stars there was just this profound feeling of i was actually furthest i had been from home like i was out in the middle of nowhere I was alone and it was a little scary, but I actually felt the most comforted and the most at home uh, that I'd felt in a long time. Mm. And I think part of that was thinking of all the people that have looked up at these same constellations and at the moon and at the stars and uh, just imagine such beautiful things and, and found meaning in the patterns that they were creating, feeling so small, but so significant as part of the universe. And uh, that like universal connective thread to so many people looking at the same thing. It was just astounding. It just filled me with a wonder I, I still can't even process. And I'm spending years trying to communicate that to people. But you really just have to get under a great night sky and just feel that, you know, it's really special. And I, I'm sure you felt the same thing. Um, so that was really formative. And in terms of the moon as an object, I think it's the same way. It's this uh, guide point. It's a cultural touchstone. It is a unique object that has been imprinted in so many people's memories and inspired so many stories and imaginations um, that once you start thinking of the moon, you start seeing it everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. everywhere you go, there's imagery, there's icons, there's art, there's people that use it in their sayings. And um, I couldn't be more proud to help tell the story of something that has impacted so many people. So those, those are really night sky photo nights, which I still take 
it's my happy place. My, mm -hmm. uh, my partner, Gabby kind of makes fun of me because, you know, I'll be with her and we'll be on a trip and she'll go to bed and I'll kind of sneak out <laughs> with my camera until two or 3 AM photograph night sky, just because it still gives me that same feeling. And there's something about it being quiet, uh, like a light breeze, very serene. And you have a whole park or natural area to yourself. Um, it's been very peaceful for me. So, and that's a huge reason when applying a dear moon, um, I got so excited because I had formed that connection with the night sky and the stars. And, um, yeah, I grew up watching cosmos, you know, and all these other things too. So, uh, being a part of that legacy is really meaningful for me. So we talked about the national parks, any other places on earth, which are really special to you? It's a great question. I mean, so many. What's I think special about traveling in general is that you never know which experiences you're going to have that uh, kind of transcend the others or mean something really special to you. It could be the most seemingly unexciting place with a group of people that just make it an unforgettable experience or the most bucket list place that for whatever reason just doesn't transcend or feel quite as special to you. I think um, I, I really enjoyed my travels in the United States. There's a lot of beautiful places mm -hmm. and people that have completely changed my life, both in and outside the national parks. And then outside, I mean, I feel grateful to have had some really cool experiences in nature, you know, like Virunga National Park in the Congo, uh, being at the top of Mount mm. Nirangongo, a volcano mm. there, where you can stand at the top and look down at one of the world's only accessible active lava lakes and see this bubbling cauldron of lava, mm -hmm. look out just over the stunning uh, lights of Goma in the distance and the landscape. That was one of those surreal moments that I uh, just felt like magic. I just couldn't believe I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing the Northern Lights for the first time in Northern Iceland was something that really changed my perspective. And I walked away saying, like, magic exists. <laughs> I just saw something that is beyond my wildest dreams of what I could see. Um, I had a really great experience in Greenland uh, working for a documentary about Bill Nye. Uh, the science guy mm -hmm. and the, sure. an amazing space enthusiast where mm -hmm. I helped contribute some cinematography and drone aerials and me, the directors and Bill basically lived at a climate change research base in Greenland for 10 days. Uh, as Bill talked to scientists about them drilling for ice cores and capturing mm -hmm. ancient atmospheres in them and using that to chart climate change. And so I, I guess the theme here is I found some of the most meaning in what I do in these most extreme environments and situations that feel just beyond reality, you know, beyond my wildest imaginations at the time. Um, I've traveled to a lot of countries in Africa as well, uh, South America, Asia, and it's a broad scope, but there's just such a number of cultural experiences that taught me a lot and meant a lot to me. So. Mm -hmm. so if all goes well, the trip you guys are taking and then as well as the trip that um, Artemis, Artemis 2 and 3 and 4 astronauts are taking, this is going to set something into motion which, is gonna, which may establish a much more permanent presence of humanity on the moon. And is that something you've thought about and sort of what, you know, what kind of future you would like to see of humanity on the moon? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us ideally get excited at that thought. I mean, what an amazing idea to not just think of the International Space Station, you know, that, that I've been lucky enough to go and track a few times in the night sky and point to someone and go, see that really bright dot right there? That's the ISS. Yeah. There's people up there. Um, but to think of that on a scale as far as the moon, I mean, that's remarkable, right? Like both for science, um, for inspiration, you know, for a next step of culture and coming closer to becoming that space-faring species. I think with any of these things, we need to be mindful of environmental impact, um, do it in a way that's sustainable, both for our planet and beyond. But from my perspective, as someone who grew up loving space programs and movies and Apollo 13, Carl mm -hmm. Sagan and the night sky. I mean, that is just an incredible idea. So, um, yeah, I mean, my short answer is it, it gets me really excited. Um, besides, um, Carl Sagan, Cosmos and Apollo 13, any other sort of works of science fiction? I'm, I'm just going to assume you're a science fiction fan as well. Any other works of science fiction you really like and enjoyed? Oh man, so many. And it's kind of more modern. I really love films like Oblivion were really big for mm -hmm. me. I mean, M83 just does this astounding soundtrack that I still listen to. Um, obviously there's films like The Martian that were really exciting and mm -hmm. uh, feel feel more like reality sometimes in science fiction. Um, in general, what really inspires me as a filmmaker is that uh, 
as far as I know, I mean, SpaceX worked with Hollywood costume designers as they were developing their spacesuits. And mm -hmm. these companies, as they're making new spacecrafts, aren't just thinking about what's the most efficient or what's the best use of technology, but also how does it look? Mm -hmm. How does it feel? How does it inspire? So what I think on a more general level is just like remarkable is that, yes, we've seen uh, science fiction tried to predict the future in some ways or, or paint a picture of the future and the future grows into that. But we also are seeing these films and reading these books and imagining what that's like and then actually building our rockets <laughs> to feel like that in some ways mm -hmm. and become inspired. So it's almost like we wrote our own future in a mm -hmm. way or at least inspired it. And so that's what really excites me watching any of these films and these landscapes is um, how as filmmakers and storytellers and artists, we're actually helping uh, create that that future scape as well as trying to predict what it's actually going to grow into. And so um, I just love it. You know, I, I'm here for it. And I think that uh, as you could tell, this stuff just gets me really excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since you've learned that you're part of the crew, um, what have you, I mean, you mentioned uh, Today Show. Okay, but so what have you been up to? Sort of like, for example, have you have you done more research on like uh, any remaining burning questions you have? Um, is, I don't know, training started or yeah, what, ha what have you been up to? Yeah. So in terms of like training and next steps in that sense, um, we're still, the timeline's still being developed. So there's no mm -hmm. new information there. What we are looking towards is the orbital launch of Starship. It's going to be yep. a really exciting Very moment. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of next steps, that's a really big one for us. Um, but no, I mean, in this kind of crazy and amazing week, a lot of it's aside from just some press has been filled with friends and family and people in my life reaching out and mm -hmm. saying, is this real? Is this actually happening. I'm so excited and making sure I'm really responding to everyone and having these conversations. And I've been keeping all this whole, our whole crew has, we've been keeping this secret for a year, uh, which has been difficult. Uh, and also it felt so surreal, you know, outside the bounds of reality, it was almost easy sometimes to let it drift to the back burner for a moment, but we've been holding on to this secret. So it's been about having some moments of joy just to appreciate all of this and that it's out and that we can finally stand as a crew and stand with MZ and the Dear Moon Project mm -hmm. and say, we did this, we're going to do this. And we we're so excited to help begin sharing our story. Um, but yeah, it's been a lot of talking to family and friends right before the announcement. I had a chance to make some phone calls to people who still hadn't heard about it. And there were still many people, many, many people when it was announced, um, that hadn't heard about it kind of saying, mm. what, like, what is going on? Um, so yeah. And I'm already working on, uh, establishing connections, reaching out to more people. There have been people who reach out to me that will help me begin getting some of the guidance, uh, mentorship partnerships, mm -hmm. both in terms of camera, camera manufacturing, uh, learning how to, to film or, or take photos in space and zero gravity. And so, yeah, it's kind of been game time, uh, but also something that's been important for me. And I know other crew members, as I've spoken to them is making sure that we're all, uh, just processing this, you know, finding mm -hmm. joy and the, the relief and the feeling that we get to finally be a part of this mission and represent your moon. So it's been a whirlwind of a week, but one I'll remember forever. And I'm already mm. smiling about everything that's happening. You know, what what an honor. So Jeez, it's, it's, it's really only been a week, hasn't it? And so, by, by the way, I just thank you so much. And of course, one of the people who reached out to you was was myself. And I feel very honored that you chose to spend time with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me maybe finish off by what may seem like some more mundane questions. Um, but I thought it might be interesting. So, and maybe it's something you've thought about, maybe not. And probably I should have sent these questions to you in advance. But when you guys go, will go to the moon or around the moon, I should say, um, presumably you will be, you know, allowed to bring in some, bring along some personal items as well. So sort of, I don't know what size, but you know, if you had to bring along um, a book, an item of food and a song, what might be your choices? Wow. That's a big one. Okay. Let me think about this for a second. Sure. So if I were to bring a book, a food, and one song. And this is very off the cuff. So my yes. answer for this might be different down the line. We won't hold you to it. And yes. a couple, couple of these are going to be untraditional answers. I'm going to twist them a little bit. I think in terms of a book, I'd really like to bring some writings and letters from my grandparents and from my mm -hmm. parents and loved ones, um, just because representing my grandparents and my family and um, all the people in my life is really important to me. 
Um, and it, it, we even ask about an item, but something that was really mm-hmm. meaningful for me was when I did uh, the Today Show. For the first time, I actually wore my grandfather's watch. Mm-hmm. And he passed from Parkinson's when I was uh, 12. And he had a very entrepreneurial spirit, uh, worked really hard and kind of lived the the kind of life that we'd now consider that traditional American dream, where his family mm-hmm. were Russian Jewish immigrants and mm-hmm. came to the U.S. through Ellis Island, you know, and certain of a better life. He left with no money, like $5 in his pocket to an engineering school that accepted him for free, became an engineer in World War II, um, and then turned that experience into a business selling construction machinery and really built a life for himself and our family. And so I I just love to bring a piece of his writing and my Mm -hmm. other grandparents and my family. Um, And I know it's a bit of a twist on the book, but that just, that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) In terms of food, uh, probably a sleeve of Oreo cookies. I think they'd be really fun to eat in zero G. They're kind of my comfort food. And um, I just have a feeling they'd hit the right spot. (laughs) It might might crumble a little bit in zero G. (laughs) It's part of the fun. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. And then a song. This is a bit of a curveball, too. Um, and my my girlfriend's going to kill me for saying this, but she has a really beautiful singing voice. Mm-hmm. And I think I'd ask her to sing something and record it for me and just have it up there with me for a little she, piece of home. She, she's on now. It's on public record. <laughs> it's on public record. Um, so that would that mean a lot. And I'm a huge fan, for example, of the Golden Record. I think that was like mm-hmm. such an amazing achievement and inspiring moment. So in terms of bringing actual music and media up there, there's going to be so many other ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to have my playlists really thought through and work with mm-hmm. some really cool people to think that through more. But well, and, uh, for and, now, I'm going to keep it personal. Yeah. And, and, and also, of course, you guys are going to have Steve, Steve Aoki with you. <laughs> I think Steve is going to bring some playlists too. That's, that's the, that's the magic of it, right? It's like, we're all going to bring some kind of personality, some kind of culture, little items. Uh, Maybe we'll share a couple snacks, you know, I'll share my Mm -hmm. cookie for someone else's comfort food they brought. And uh, Mm -hmm. that's, what's going to be really fun about this all. Yeah. it's, It's going to be some sort of amazing fellowship. I mean, thank, thank you so much. For being on again it's, it's a great honor i know you you must be getting so many requests you must be so busy it's a very special time in your life trying to process this all so really thank you very much and for myself from all of our listeners around the world in over 100 countries you know for spending time here and you know, I want to come back to something you said at the beginning you you know you're basically preserving your values of i think you said kindness empathy and storytelling i think that's that's beautiful and you know if you can do that for dear moon that's going to be just great for humanity so good luck with that and it's been a pleasure having you on Thank you. Uh, the pleasure is mine. And thanks to anyone listening. It, it means the world to me and our crew. And we're just so excited. You know, I hope to talk to you again during this process. We can keep talking. Oh, so. yes, we can definitely do it again in the in the run up. <laughs> thanks, Brandon. And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast lastly if you have any feedback including ideas for guests and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com see you for the next episode